Hey gang, I'm Nikki LaCroce and you're listening to Who the Fuck. And on today's show, I'm sharing the mic with Dave Albin. And Dave is the number one firewalk instructor in America and owner of Firewalk Adventures, as well as a keynote speaker, corporate trainer, and sobriety mentor. Dave's worked with Tony Robbins for over 19 years and started Firewalk Productions in 2014, now having walked over hundreds of thousands of people across those hot coals. And since then, Dave's passion and purpose has led him to work with major clients across the globe, including Google and NASA. But as Dave will share, his path that he took to become who he is today was not easy. Now 35 years sober, Dave seeks to empower others on their healing journeys and help them discover their own life callings. Welcome to the show, Dave. (laughs) God, that was so... Well, great job, Nikki. Thank you. That was beautifully read. Well, thank you. It's a great resume. I got to be honest with you. (laughs) I sit here and listen to it. I'm at the end. I'm going, okay, well, great show. All right. Nice yeah. to be here. You know? <laughs> You're like, yep, that's correct. I did do those things. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, that's cool. Thank you for, you know, that's real. That's called, I call that all in. You took it and looked at me really carefully so that when you can present to your audience, you did it in a, in a really, really congruent way. And so I love that. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. The reason that I do this show is because I want the opportunity for people like yourself to share your story and, and tell your story your way. And so, you know, Obviously, we'll get into the depths of Firewalk Adventures and sort of everything that you do there. But I'd love to start a little bit with how your personal development journey started that ultimately led you to this path. Oh, I'd love to. Um, you know, started young. <laughs> I mean, very young, uh, at the age of five years old, really. Um, I had been born to a single mom in Hollywood, California. And two months before I was born, Uh, my biological father, who uh, was a pilot in Korea. And we don't know what happened. We just know something happened. And they put a plate in his head to save his life. Well, it also took his life because two months before I was born, he complained about pain all the time. He told my mom, he didn't know how much longer he could take it. And one day he said, I'm going to the grocery store. And we never saw or heard from the man again. And so that left mom with two other boys, right, from another man, uh, along with my cousin, myself, and my grandmother, all living in a one bedroom apartment in Hollywood, California, six people. So it was a little much. Well, she was working. Mom was working at the Roosevelt hotel in Hollywood, right? She was a baby boomer. She came out of world war II. She worked her butt off like all the other women did in world war II. They did everything. Why the men were off the war. What did the women do? They built Jeeps. My mom was known as Rosie, the riveter. She literally worked for McDonnell Douglas. She built airplanes. Wow. And so mom knew hard work. She was also a product of the great depression. So they didn't throw anything away. They fixed everything. They learned just everything, you know, in terms of of what it takes to survive. It was a beautiful thing to grow up in that environment as a product of the 60s, literally, right? So when I was five, mom realized she couldn't take care of me anymore. She couldn't feed me. So she did a very loving thing. She put me up for adoption. And her sister, my aunt, Pat, adopted me. And her and Bob, her husband, who was a career military officer, took me from Hollywood to Long Beach. And it was life changing for sure. And when I got there, I mean, it was talk, it was perfect. I mean, it was Little House on the Prairie, and and you know, <laughs> every every show you've ever, ever seen on TV where there was goodness, it was just great. Beautiful little house in Long Beach, California. I could ride my bicycle to the to Seal Beach, you know, during the summer. I mean, it was just perfect, Southern California. Yeah. You know, we had gone camping. We did a lot of things together because Bob was a good guy. He was an officer. He was making, he made a good wage. He, he was smart with his money. Uh, Pat was a homemaker. My mother, I mean, she could cook and clean and do stuff. She taught me how to do stuff. I mean, if you've never slept on sheets that have been washed, hand washed, and then dried outside, it's it's one of the most unbelievable things you could ever imagine. And until you experience it, I, I can't even tell you what, what freshness feels and smells like. They try to recreate so, that in the commercials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. So that was my life, uh, literally, growing up with Bob and Pat Albin. And then when I was 11, now this is in the summer of 1964, the first day of summer, very first day, they pulled me out of the TV room in the morning. Mom goes, come in the kitchen. We need to speak with you. And I thought, oh, cool. Mom, dad's going to tell us where we're going camping. I bet you we're going to Yosemite. I bet we're going to, you know, Crater Lake or Big Bear or Lake Arrowhead or Lake Havasu or somewhere in Southern California, Northern California, because we always did. We had a trailer. We went camping all the time. So I'm like, yeah, cool. Here I, here I come. You know, I'm ready. Next thing you know, she sets me down and she puts her hand on my arm and she looks at me with tears in her eyes. And she goes, David, what we have to tell you is 
we're not your parents. What? What, what does that mean? That's like walking out, outside and see the sky's blue. And they go, the sky's blue. And they go, no, it's not. Well, yes, it is. Yes, it, yes, you are. What do you mean? And so it was a very difficult moment in my life to, to process it. Because can you I can't. You, can I ask you a yeah. question? Um, sure, so, yeah, of course. So you seem to have a really vivid memory also of going into that conversation and your thoughts around yeah. what your expectations were versus what it was. And that's a long yeah. time ago, right? I yeah. I I remember very few things from probably my preteen years. And I think that, you know, I would imagine that that memory of your expectations stays pretty firm in, in your mind and in your heart because of the kind of drop off that happened in terms of what they ended up sharing with you. Do you feel yeah. like that's a big part of why that first part is so memorable too, is that your expectation was just so different than what the actual message was that they were sharing. It it, it had me ready for like this really great surprise. Yeah. Right. So your brain is at an all time high. It's like yeah. in a peak state, right? It's almost like a firewalk. You're like, Oh, excitement. Oh, cool. What's going to happen? Really neat. Awesome. Boom. Yeah. And then bam. Yeah. And so now emotion comes in, which heightens your state as well. Yeah. We're like, you know, think of anything. How, uh, what, when, when Kennedy was assassinated, right? There's not a kid my age that doesn't know exactly where they were, what they were doing, that, that absolute moment. It, for me, it was 9 11. So you're right. Okay. Yeah. I was yeah, getting ready get to go. That. And I'm sure for a lot of the generation, that was 9 yeah. 11. You know, where you were, what was going on, or maybe when John Lennon was killed or whatever, that's what that moment was. Yeah, I knew yeah. everything. I could tell you all everything, every smell, every color, everything that was going on in that moment. I could hear the TV still on in the TV room. I mean, all of it. Yeah. Very, very, very vivid what my mind captured in that moment. Mm -hmm. So what happened from there, though, was shortly after they told me this, I'll be, let me back up. I remember they said something to me. She goes, oh, you know, I want, to, I want you to know who your mom is. Your mom is your Aunt Dean. Well, I knew who Aunt Dean was. I didn't even like her. And I don't want to say I didn't like her. It's just that she was always touching me. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I wonder why. I was her son. She wanted to cuddle with me. She wanted to hold me. She wanted to be around me. Duh. But I didn't know that in that moment. Do you know why you didn't, uh, why you were uncomfortable with that? Like, was it because you felt because like this she was, is my aunt? Why does she want this attention? Or was it different yeah, than that? Because it was pretty, in, it was, you know, she never touched me inappropriately. I want to be right. crystal clear about that. Yeah, I understand. But it was always one, you know, she she was kind of manic anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was like uh, energetically she, also just disarming. Very much so. Very much so. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for, uh, thanks for detailing. Yeah. Well, we can go deep here. I'm good with that. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love it. This is what, like, what made our first conversation so wonderful, Dave, and why I've been looking forward to this. You are so candid and raw and honest, and I admire your willingness and the vulnerability to not just speak to it in terms of what your experience was, but how it shaped you and, and the depth with which it impacted you. I don't think a lot of people make the active choice to access that, um, particularly people who are boomers, if I'm being completely honest with you, because I have, I mean, my own parents, my friend's parents, 100%. it's like, you know, it's so uncomfortable to go to these places. So a lot of it is that happened. I don't need to think about it again. So I really admire and appreciate your willingness and desire to share your story. Well, in, in, our, in the defense of the boomers, we were told the opposite. Well, I know this. I know this. Right? It's, Men it's, don't it's, cry, right? Yeah. All that stuff. So when I learned a lot of the, what I was taught culturally back then wasn't true. I, I woke up to that. So the epiphany was, you know, not telling your story and being vulnerable and, tell, and just tearing the scab off and letting people know who you are is very empowering. As long mm -hmm. as you're not using it as a weapon and you're using it as a tool to show people that it's okay. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I've been around a lot of really wealthy people and they talk about all this money and this and that. And I look around at other people and I'm going, we don't give a shit. I don't mm -hmm. care how much money you make. You know what I want to know about? I want to know about your struggles and how you overcame them. This That's is why valuable. I adore you, Dave. This is why I adore you, because I feel the exact same way. Because at the end of the day, frankly, I think part of my philosophy is really if you are compensating 
by just needing yes. more and more and more. Yes. That tells me that you have unhealed parts of yourself that you don't want to access. And the best thing that you can do is try to sort of shroud that with this distraction while mean while you're you're wow. suffering somewhere, you know, and, oh, and it's God. hard because we were as you said, a lot of people, and this isn't just your generation, I think that to your point, 100% generationally, that is completely valid. But I think in general, the amount of men who have come on this show in the last year, and talking about the importance of like getting deep, being vulnerable, and women as well, but I think to your point, just categorically from a gender stereotype perspective is don't show it, keep it in, let it be what it is, just grin and bear it. And at the end of the day, it doesn't serve us. We're just, no. we're sort of empty <laughs> shells of ourselves if we're trying to fill that with something that isn't just the actual work and, and bringing ourselves inward. You nailed it. 100% right there. Um, and so I've come down a long road, though. You know, I've had yeah. a lot of men in my life who had to help me and encourage me and inspire me to go, Jay, you've got a hell of a story. Go tell it. Yeah. Because it's going to help someone. That's the bottom line. That's Absolutely. why you tear the scab off. That's why you get out there. That's why I can stand in front of thousands of people. I don't care. And I'm going boom, 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 boom. Because if one person out there who's suffering from drugs or alcohol or is suffering because of someone in their life, right, then, hey, I'm all in. Yeah. Because I learned early on in AA, I, I got something beat in my head from the very beginning in some of my very first AA meetings. And it said to me, when anyone anywhere reaches out, I want the hand of AA to be there. And for that, I'm responsible. Well, that's what I got when I got to AA. It was unconditional love from these men. It was insane. I was dangerous. I was lethal when I first got to AA. And they're like, yeah, 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 we hear you. We all are. Shut up, sit down, and don't take a drink today. That's what you need to do. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, I was in a tough love men's group. We didn't take no bullshit. They just literally stop. Either sit down and listen to us and do what we tell you to do or leave. Go. Yeah. Well, because it's like you if want, you're not you going want... to commit to it, then what's the point? Well, you know, here, here's what they, there's, they had a kind of a nicer, softer way of putting it sometimes. I mean, I believe that because I know it's a vulnerable place to be. Right. But it's like, look, tell you what, do what we teach you to do for, for 90 days, do 90 meetings in 90 days. And if it doesn't work, go back out. We'll refund your misery in full. I remember thinking, okay, then they got me. It was a way to stay fine. Prove us wrong. And they weren't. They were spot on. That's great. Yeah. But back to mom. Um, so yeah, mom was just being mom. My biological mom was just being mom and she cared and she loved. And, and, you know, we had a wonderful relationship based after that. Uh, it was a little bizarre at times, uh, but it was still good. So at 11, right after they told me this, probably within two weeks, both Bob, Bob and Pat Albin, my aunt and uncle who are now raising me started drinking and they had drank up until the moment they, they adopted me when I was at five. So they had drink in five years, none. Well, they both started drinking and my, my life went, boop. I mean, it took a hard right turn because mm -hmm. alcohol showed up and alcohol took control of everything. And so Pat wasn't so bad. Bob, not so much. Bob got mean. Bob got nasty. He got ugly. He got violent. And I had to run interference between him and mom, between him and losing his license and, and you know, be, getting arrested. Arrested and you know, went riding his bicycle to the bar, and I was the guy that always had to go get him out of the out of the bar and take him home because buddies would drop him off. So I was the go between. I was the mediator between all that. So I had to learn the negotiations of all that. That's such a, it was a pain in the ass. It was a pain in the ass, right? Um, and then you know, li literally, so I saw these two wonderful people turn into these alcoholic, whatever you want to call them. And then, so one day they went to the grocery store. They, you know, they did that back in those days. You could leave an 11 year old at home by themselves yeah. all the time. All you did is call the neighbor, said, Hey, Joanne, it's Pat Albin. Hey, David's at home. If he needs anything, can he walk across the street? Yeah, tell him to come over now and I'll make him a bologna sandwich. Okay, yeah. thanks. Bye. Boom. That's how it worked. So they left. And as soon as they left, I knew where the booze was. It was hiding in plain sight. And I went and opened the cabinet. I took it out and I took a coffee cup and I filled it, Nikki, about half full. And boom, I wanted to know what's going on. It's nasty, smelling, stinking, thought I was going to throw up. Yeah, but here's how I felt. I felt like rocket fuel poured into my body. I never had a chance, ever. I never drank normally. I have no idea what that's like. 
because one's too many and a thousand is not enough for me from the moment I took my first drink. So they say all the time, yeah, can you become an alcoholic on your first drink? Sure did for me. Because I started thinking about it and drinking and stealing and, you know, on and it just it just escalated. By the time I was a junior in high school, like within a month of me being in my, in my junior year, they called me in the principal's office and said, Alvin, you're out. <laughs> OK, guys, see ya. I was fine with it. I could care less. Were you showing up was, to school under the influence? Oh, yeah. When I was showing up at the point was get, you know, smoke some some smoke some cannabis. Why go to school? Who cares? Well, yeah, I was already playing the song that Paul Simon wrote. In my head, when I think back of all the crap I learned in high school, it's no wonder I can think at all. Yeah. That was going through my head, Paul, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, right? Pretty good lyrics, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, so now it was, you know, it was survival. Now, but I was already an entrepreneur, too, at that spot, at that point. Because when I was younger, number one, I had a paper route. I, did, I wanted to get the hell out of the house, so I did whatever I could. Uh, one, I had a paper route. So that teaches you how to be an entrepreneur because you got to mm -hmm. run everything. Yep. Uh, I sold flowers on a street corner. Pat had a green thumb, as they say. She could grow flowers. Of course, she came from the Depression. She knew how to keep things alive. <laughs> yeah. She knew how to grow vegetables and how to grow flowers. And she knew all of that, right? Because she had to. Yeah. So she grew some of the most beautiful flowers you've ever seen in your life. And she'd go and she'd cut them and she'd cut them at an angle and put them in water. Yep. And then she would, she would you know, she would arrange it and they were gorgeous because she had this beautiful touch for eye, like, like a creativity, you know, like a mm -hmm. florist, if you would. And I lived across the street from a golf course. So guess what happened there? I'd go take my Stingray bike and I'd ride the perimeter and find golf balls. And there were certain holes where a right-handed hitter wasn't a good golfer to have a slice. They'd hit it over the fence all the time. You'd go over there and find five, six, ten golf balls all the time. So I took those home, washed them, went back to the golf course, got the little containers they came in because they threw them out at the clubhouse. Because they would put them on display and they just throw them out. I grabbed them, cleaned the balls, put them in there, would go into the parking lot and sell them to the golfers as they were coming and going. Oh, that's amazing. So, yeah, I had an entrepreneurial spirit. I love the ingenuity. <laughs> right? So, again, when they kicked me out of school, I went, see ya. Don't joke. This isn't funny, right? It was a great gift for me. I mean, I knew that what I was learning, what I learned up to that point, wasn't going to make me a living. So, you from a very young age, were already in the mentality of like how you survive. And that's something that I think is really critical to acknowledge too, is that you, first of all, like the zero through six formative years where like everything, your like entire personality is developing. You had yes. a, a very different life. Then a few years later, you find out that the people who have raised you are not your biological parents. And so Correct. that disorients you a little bit. And then yeah. now they, fall into alcoholism and you have, do you feel like at this point you were essentially raising yourself? Um, I don't know that I looked at it that way. I did have some men in my life that were very, they were there to encourage. One of them specifically was Walt Pasco, my dear friend, Russ, who lived three houses down. Uh, Walt, um, Russ's dad, Walt, worked for Procter & Gamble. And he worked in the plant where that was called the tide slide. <laughs> and so this mechanical machine that would take a cardboard box into a machine, fold it, glue it, fill it, seal it, and send it down the, called the slide. It would slide down this big slide and they would, they would box it up or package it up and put it on pallets. Well, well, Walt was the mechanic. He was the head mechanic in the plant. Wow. So if anything broke down, Walt would fix it. He could fix anything. So I would walk by his house and his garage was in the back, back there, right? And the gates was were always open. He was always tinkering, doing something. And, and, I'd, stop, and I'd stop and look and he'd go, hey, come here. I need to show you something. <laughs> he didn't need to show me anything. Yeah. He knew mom and dad were drinking. He knew my dad was, you know, he's a good man. He's a great guy. Smart dude. But alcohol kicked his ass and he turned into an animal when he was drinking. And so Walt knew. So he, you know, he'd, he'd spend a little time with me and he'd tell me, if you ever need anything, you come, I'm here for you. And that's all he kind of did. He didn't ever ask, really. He didn't 
your stat. You didn't go down, you know, are you okay? Being, he just didn't do any of that. He just wanted he just wanted me to know that there was a man three doors away that was there to help me and love me if I needed it. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I think that those are, I imagine in retrospect, that probably feels maybe a lot bigger than it might have at the moment because you can kind yeah. of see the impact of that now. Would yeah. you say that's accurate? Yeah, definitely. And there were a lot of the moms and dads. I grew up on a street, was full of kids. Yeah, same. I mean, a ton. I mean, we had two boys that both went to the NFL. No kidding. Right. Absolutely. Bill Reed, who lived three doors to the right of me, ended up playing for the 49ers. He went to Long Beach, he went to Long Beach City, Long Beach State, went to Stanford. And from Stanford, he went uh, behind uh, Bill Walsh and was the center for Jim Plunkett. If you know your football, that would people go, oh, yeah, I know who that is. I, uh, I, can't, I can't pretend that I know enough of it, but that's um, all right. I, they, <laughs> yeah, I respect did. it. Um, so he played for San Fran. And, and of course, I was always told, don't say San Fran. We don't like that. Yeah, either. totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm saying it anyway, just because you told me and to be spite. That's how I'm going to do it. So I'm going to San Fran, people. <laughs> My other buddy, Tim Riley, um, I think he went to the Eagles. Philadelphia. Okay. All right. Nice. And so we had, you know, we had our own football team. Yeah. My street had a football team. We played one of the four A high schools and beat them. So Literally. you had a community. You had a community that kept you. Um, I I don't want to necessarily say safe because I, I don't know that that's the the right term, but it sounds like that it offered you the emotional security maybe that you needed in certain ways that you weren't having at home or what would you right. say like the impact yeah. of that was? Yeah, there was a lot of really cool kids and I had really, really strong relationships with a whole bunch of them. Uh, my best friend in life, Carl Whitaker. Carl went on to make an incredible career as a firefighter, mm -hmm. uh, both as a, a paramedic for 14 years. He became a lieutenant. He became a captain. He became a chief. He became the head instructor at El Camino Firefighter Academy in Southern Cal. Um, he, he was the president of the union. I mean, if you were a firefighter in Southern California, at one time you knew Carl Chief Whitaker. And that was my best friend. Yeah. And then, you know, across the street was Danny Shaw. Down the street, we had the Reeds. Again, they were real close with him. He was the pro football player across the street directly. I bet we had what felt to be 50 kids on the street. And we all kind of got along for the most part. But some of us had really great. There were 10 of them, at least on the street, that I was super, super close with. Yeah. And I still communicate with them to this day, which is cool. Hopefully someday they'll see this podcast and hear what I I'm talking so. about. I hope so. That's amazing. Right? I love that you remember everybody. I think that that's a, that's a testament, right, to those connections yeah. that you oh, create. Yeah. yeah, we remembered all. Belize Street. And yeah. and we even had our own name. It was called the Belizeans. And that really filled a void, Nikki. It really did. Yeah, that helped a like lot it. because I had a lot of kids that cared about me and loved me. And it was a couple of the girls, Lori Flanders and Tina Reed and Elise Reed. You know, again, there was just a whole bunch of them uh, that we were just real close, you know, so we, we hung out together. We were all probably within two to three years of each other. Yeah, that's great. I, I love great. that. I love that that was available to you given yeah. just sort of the tenuous nature of like where you were yeah. with your home life. So you were, you left school. Um, you obviously had the inclination and the drive to sort of figure out where you were going from there. How did you ultimately navigate your path? Um, well, you know, we are who we spend time with. So I say all the time, love your family, choose your friend, but you better choose wisely because if you don't, you will become who you spend time with. I don't care what you say, how you try to negotiate. It's not going to happen. It's just the way it is. Because if you go take your five average friends right now and you average out how much they make per year, I'll guarantee you, you're within 5%. Just the way that magical thing works. So I chose some friends and some things and some people and a way of life that was uh, pretty driven by drugs. Cocaine specifically, because cocaine was different back then. It was very clean. It was coming in from, you know, South America or Bali or you know places like this. And it wasn't it wasn't cut with fentanyl. You didn't have to worry about doing it and dying. And so at my point of it, it, it was very clean back then. I, I don't have another word. That's just the yeah. way it was. This is the 60s and the 70s. Um, and so, that, you know, I, I got into that kind of a lifestyle. I married my childhood sweetheart. We were only married for like three weeks. And I think we were on our honeymoon in Hawaii for three weeks. So that didn't work out. We were total polar opposites. 
Um, and then I met the woman that saved my life, Betsy. We, that was my second wife, amazing woman, unbelievable. She had gone from Virginia to California to get away from Virginia. And she got out there, met me and said, I got to get him out of California and took me back to Virginia. So that's how I got back to the East Coast. Okay. And once I got to the East Coast, I loved it. I was like, God, are you kidding me? Look at this. I'd never seen the seasons change in Southern Cal. I didn't know what that looked or felt like. And it was, and I went to Skyline Drive early on outside of DC uh, in Virginia. And oh my God, what a beautiful place in the fall. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And so that turned me on to the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Shenandoah Valley. And once I fell in love with this, there was no going back. I mean, I that's how I feel city. about the Pacific Northwest. It's funny that um, okay. we had sort of the opposite journeys, but I get it completely. It's like you're, you, did you find that you had a feeling of just sort of being at home when yeah. you were there? Oh yeah. To this day, anytime I leave, right, I get on an airplane, I fly out of Charlotte and then I don't feel home until I'm driving back up the, into, into the Appalachian mountains. Once I get to that one point and I can see that one mountain, I'm like, I'm going home. I love Here it, it yeah. is. And I love the Pacific Northwest because I, you know, I don't know that I even told you, but I, I, I did some logging in forks in okay, between this Aberdeen and Port Angeles. Me at all. I feel like, of course you, of course you had it logging on your resume. Yeah, at that was some in there. Point. I mean, isn't that where they filled Twilight? Why shouldn't I go? Right. Uh, so uh, yeah, apparently. yeah, Forks, Washington. <laughs> yeah. Um, I broke my leg and that into that career. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what? Because you were on, on to better things, on to I more purpose driven things, that's things for right? Sure. Um, so what developed from there was, um, you know, Betsy looked at me one day and said, David, I love you, but I can't do this. You're too out of control. Uh, it's too much, too much drugs, alcohol, you know, just, I was violent too. I was not a nice guy when I was drinking. It was not fun to be around. Um, and so then I got, then I married a bartender with three kids. Well, you know what I thought? I thought, well, wait a minute, hold it here. You know, bartender, hey, that helps, you know, I'll never run out of booze. Um, and then. But these three kids will help me. They'll help slow me down. Maybe get off the booze. My, t my intention was pure. Didn't happen that way. And then that just led up until that marriage uh, got to June 8th of 1988. And that was threshold day. That's when Davey said, I'm done. I, I can't deal with this pain anymore. We're not doing this another single day. It ain't going to happen. I was in so much physical and emotional pain at that point, just years of drinking and drugging and lying and cheating and stealing and corruption and, you know, everything all mixed into one. It's just all of a sudden it comes to a point and you go, that's it. I'm out. I'm not doing this. And so the only, the only thing I really thought in that moment was I want the pain to stop right now. I don't care about heaven. I don't care about hell. I don't care about any of that. I just want the pain to stop period. So I loaded my pistol. In my mouth, it went. And as I'm sitting there contemplating, I'm going, you know what? You jerk. When you pull that trigger, yeah, you're going to be dead. You won't feel anything. But what about those three kids upstairs that you could, that you agreed to be their stepfather? What about them? What about their mom? Who's going to deal with that? Who's going to, you know, they're there when the morgue comes and picks you up and the, and the newspaper comes and it's going to permeate all through school. You are killing them too. So stop being a self-centered shit and fucking man up. Find another way. Just don't do that. And I mean, I was in total conflict with myself. I'm like, fuck you. I mean, it was just, it was intense because again, I wanted the pain to stop. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, the, and then the thought comes into my head, call Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, what's interesting about that, Nikki, I didn't even know who AA was. Who's Alcoholics Anonymous? I don't know. I don't know anybody in AA. I've never met anybody that I know of in AA. It's never been mentioned to me. Where did that come from? Yeah, there it is. And so I did. I Do you believe AA in now. divine intervention? I mean, what else could it be? I don't have another answer other than the divine intervention. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. that moment, that that powerful, vulnerable moment for you, because a friend of ours recently um mm. he's been dealing with a lot emotionally and he's in a, a bad marriage um very abusive and struggling and we spoke to him the other day and he shared with us and that we were the only people that he told this to but that he had been in i think a very similar situation as yourself and also made the choice not to 
complete that action because he had the same moment of pause being like, what am I doing? Leaving my children to find me or experience this or whatever. And it's not, or whatever, sorry, that sort of minimizes it, but that first of all, I was so grateful that he felt like he could share that with us um, and that he could be vulnerable and feel safe to share that because it was emotional. I mean, he obviously didn't just tell us off the cuff, Uh, Oh, this is what happened. Right. It was, it was hard for him and it was hard to witness. And this was virtual too. So it's like, you can't give somebody a hug. And I think when we consider the impact of what's going on in our lives and how much we feel like, I don't want to burden somebody. I don't want to weigh somebody else down with my shit. It's like, I held a lot in for a really long time when I was struggling in an abusive relationship. And I had a therapist that thankfully was there in the safe space for me. But so many people after the fact, when I finally came forward with everything and it was really like the catalyst was losing my mom was just being like, fuck it. Like I need to explain what's been happening in my life. It's like, you are not a burden for experiencing life. You're not a burden for sharing with the people that are close to you that you need support or that things are happening. And I think we need to acknowledge that we are not defined by these moments in our life. We are, uh, those are building blocks of who we are. And sometimes you have to navigate that really shitty circumstance to ultimately come into who you are. And I feel like that's the for a lot of us, like that's the rock bottom, right? Something bad has happened and I know that there is no other way out and it's either this or I actually ask for help. And so what you acknowledged and what our friend acknowledged is like, I can't do this on my own because you can sit there and you can try to fight it. But like at the end of the day, what you described, I felt like I was in that room with you, Dave. I felt like I like the way that you were speaking to it is like, this is how my head's spinning. And these are all the things that I'm conflicted with in myself. And how many of us feel that way and trapped in our own lives? We have to be able to express that. And so you sharing that and, and being vivid in your description, I think is really helpful as an outsider to hear that and understand what goes through somebody's mind in a moment like that. And when you're in that moment, some of the distinctions that you'll make is that if you decide to go ahead and reach out for help, somewhere in that path, later you'll learn. You might learn it in the beginning. It might be a week, it might be a month, a year later, that that is one of the most powerful gifts you can ever give another human being. Because asking for help is literally one of the most intelligent things any human can do. We know that today. That doesn't get preached out there. That doesn't get taught. But that's the way it is. Absolutely. Because it is. And anybody that's been on either side of the fence knows it. We all know what it's like. You know how you felt, Nikki, right? The other day when this individual was trusting in you. What an amazing feeling that is. Totally. And that's the beauty of AA. I got something hanging on the wall right here. It talks about that. I mean, the the wellness side of teaching people how to put their lives back together and live, you know, in accordance with sobriety one day at a time. The magic of that is they're learning it from another drunk. They're not learning it from a doctor or a physician or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist or any of that. They don't know shit. Yeah. They've never done it. How would they know? I drink a tractor trailer load full of vodka. So when I talk to somebody that's an alcoholic, oh, I know what that feels like. Yeah. I know exactly, right? So when you come to that space and to that place with that kind of experience is because what we talked about earlier, right? I don't care how successful you are. Tell me what you did when you fucked up and how you recovered from it. That's what I want to know. Tell me about that because I know how valuable that is. Yeah. I do it all the time when I talk in my seminars and I talk to big companies and I talk about this, the same little different format sometimes, depending on, you know, the client thing. Would you not use the word fuck? And I'd say, why the fuck can't I? <laughs> right. Well, clearly, kind of I a, have a similar Gary, philosophy. So, <laughs> Gary, Gary V and us, right? Yeah, Gary V is the same way. Tony Robbins, same way. Uh, look, relax. It's a word. Just chill out. It has nothing to do with it. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, the bottom line is so, where, uh, where was I? Oh, so I'm coming into the how did I get into the personal development industry? How did yeah. that come taking it? Where did, where did that stick its head in the door? Right. So, that came from once I got to AA. That first day, right? And I said, okay, we'll call AA. I called. I got this lady on the phone. I affectionately call her Madge. Because she talked like this. 
right? She smoked at least two packs of palm oil non-filters a day. Well, she was brutal. She kicked my ass because she was the gatekeeper. She's mm-hmm. the one who would make a decision about making the phone call to call someone to come pick me up. So she had to do certain protocols, right? And so apparently I must have convinced her <laughs> that I needed help. And she sent a guy by the name of Lauren to come pick me up. And when Lauren came and got me, man, he got me, he he stayed with me all day. He went through four meetings with me. He went to a 1230, a 430, a 630, and an 830 and stayed with me. A perfect stranger. Uh, And after I heard my story, what's going on, he just didn't want to leave my side. Took me home that night. By the way, when I I left one of the meetings, this was a men's group, by the way, all men's. And so they gave me a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they all signed it. They wrote their name in there. They said, before you take that first drink, call one of us. And they put their first name and their phone number, handed it to me. I took it home. Eight o'clock the next morning, my phone rings. Hey, Dave, it's John from AA. How are you doing this morning? I'm like, how the fuck do you think I'm doing this morning? I want to kill somebody, pal. And I might start with you. <laughs> He's like, he loved John. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you, man. He said, look, man, I know where you live. And uh, you told me where you lived and we exchanged numbers. And I said, I'd call you this morning. So I'm calling you. So let's do this. Does this work for you? Let me come get you. Let me take you out to breakfast. You know, let's talk a little bit and then we'll go to a meeting. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so I said, yes. Right. And that's part of life. When someone say, reaches out one, for right? help, say yes. God damn it. Don't say no. Let them help you. Cause again, it's so good for you. It's so good for them. And so uh, there it was. And two days turned into a week, and a week turned into a month. And in a month, I got a little coin. It said 30 days sober on it. To, on the back, it said, to thy own self be true, AA. And then I got one for two months, three months, six months, nine months, and one year. And then that on June 8th, this last June 8th of 88, uh, 90 or 2000, and where are we? I <laughs> uh, Sorry, I got shut down in 2020. I have no recollection what happened after that. Um, <laughs> So now it's 35 years. And so I'm going into year 37. Incredible. Well, what happened, what happened was, is that as I was getting sober, I I, I had insomnia. <clears throat> so I'm up late at night all the time, three o'clock in the morning. There I am. There he is. He's got his infomercial going. Mr. Mr. Gunthy Ranker himself, Mr. Personal Power, 30 day program for total success. A young, enthusiastic, obnoxious Tony Robb. And I couldn't stand it. I thought, man, how pompous can you get? But you know what? He said a couple of things that I paid attention to that made a lot of sense. He said, we'll do more to avoid pain than we will to gain pleasure. I remember thinking, well, that's why I drank. I did drugs to try to avoid pain and gain pleasure. And it forsake me. (laughs) I got to a point where it didn't do either. But I was still, but I couldn't quit. And then he said, the thing that really got me, he said, the driving force in our life is we're motivated, motivated out of inspiration or desperation. And I went, holy shit. Are you talking to me, Tony? Because yeah. that's exactly how I felt. And so I said, okay, here's my money. Take my money. Here you go. Take my American Express card. And he sent it to me. It's it called Personal Power. And it came in a box, you know, and it came on these little white things called cassette tapes. <laughs> so you had to plug one in every day for five days. And then on the weekend, you listen to these subliminal tapes, which were phenomenal. <clears throat> so that all went down in 1988. Well, what happened from there, I loaned my program. I loaned that tape program to a buddy of mine in AA. And he calls me seven years later in 1995 and said, hey, did you know that Tony Robbins is coming to town? I'm like, no. He goes, dude, come on. <laughs> you got me into this. You got to go with me. And I said, I'll go if the date's right. When's the date? We looked at the dates. Yeah, I can go. He goes, oh, frick. Awesome. He goes, I'll make all the arrangements. I'll call you back. Well, hell, he calls me back an hour later. He goes, done. We pick up the tickets at Will Call, and here's what they told us to do. Number one, bring snacks. We're going to spend a lot of time in the room. <laughs> <laughs> what a what an understatement that was. Uh, drink a lot of water. You got to stay really hydrated. Really super important. Bring water with you. Uh, be ready to play full out and bring a good attitude. Okay. How much was the ticket, Dan? Seven hundred dollars. Six ninety five. What? Seven hundred dollars? He goes, yeah, man. He goes, you can pay me back anytime you want. I go, that's not the point. 
Don't worry. 700 bucks, I'll play full out. You know, call me next time because maybe I'd check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but right? man, good thing he didn't, right? Well, right. But what's $700 back in 1995 worth today? 7.3 million? I don't know. <laughs> what the hell? The rate of inflation, probably. Honestly. <laughs> it's worth it's worth a hell of a lot more than $700. We know that. Yeah. Uh, Should have bought crypto. That's all I'm saying. Right. <laughs> Um, so that, so there we are, we're in, well, the day comes, right? It's the event. So we get there and, and we get seated and Tony takes the stage at two in the afternoon. Oh, and by the way, let me back up when he's telling me about the event, you know, pick, you know, water and snacks and all that, just as he's getting ready to get off the phone, he goes, Oh, by the way, I almost forgot to tell you, um, we're going to be doing a fire walk. And my brain went, Oh, bullshit. Hell no. Now, I'm not saying anything, but my brain's going, no, bullshit, ain't going to happen. No way in hell. I'm not going to do any firewalk. I want to go see Tony. That's fine. But we'll let that crazy people do that shit. I'm not doing that. And this is all going through my head. It's because I'm lying to Dan. I'm going, yeah, Dan, sure, firewalk. Yeah, sounds interesting. All right, man. See you later. I'll see you then. Boom. No, I'm not doing this. And you know what's interesting about that? I don't know what a firewalk is. How the hell do I know what a firewalk is or what it was in 1995? I got no references, nothing. I know nothing about a firewalk. All it is, it sounded like something I sure as hell didn't want to do. And fear kicked in like it had always done throughout my entire life. And said, nope, you can't have that. I'm going to take that from you. Because that's what fear does. Fear's a liar. And I've, learned, and I've learned that to this day now, right? Didn't know it then in the moment. So I'm just saying no. Well, you get to the event. Tony takes the stage at two. Next thing I know, it's after midnight, Nikki. I've been in a room with this dude for 10 hours. All of a sudden, he goes, take your shoes off. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, hell no. I know where you're going with that, pal. You're not tricking me. Well, the problem is I'm sitting in a seminar. There's 3,500 people. And guess what they're doing? They're taking their damn shoes off. And I remember thinking, no, people don't. Don't go <laughs> towards the light. Shit, you're falling for it. No. So now I got a dilemma. They're all taking their shoes off, and I'm not. So if I don't take my shoes off and go out there, everybody's going to know I'm a chicken chip. So I'm like, well, we can't have that. So just relax, man. It's okay. Just take your shoes off. When you get out there, go hide in the back. You don't have to do this. No one's going to know. That's what's going through my head. And so that's what I do. I take my shoes off. Well, it gets worse. So before Tony gets 3,500 people to go out in this giant parking lot to do this big firewalk, <clears throat> he, he gets them to start clapping and chanting. 3,500 people are standing there now. They're walking outside going, yes, yes, yes. Right? And I'm walking out there going, no, uh -uh, I ain't doing this. It gets worse. When you physically get out there, he's got African drummers. So it's dun 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 dun, dun, dun. and you're well, and you're what a dog and pony show, and your brain's going what in the hell? Like what did I get myself into? <laughs> what did I get myself into? Now when you walk out there, you can see over in the corner the giant fire. It's huge. It's beautiful, and it's probably it's a pit. And it's probably 30, 40 feet wide and 70 feet long. And, and it's been burning hot hardwood all day. They probably started stoking it at 2 o'clock. And now it's 10 hours later. And there's this big, giant, beautiful pile of blue coals and a blue flame. It's absolutely gorgeous. Well, how do you, fire, how do you firewalk 3,500 people logistically? Well, what you do is you take that big pit. And you take a wheelbarrow over to it, and you fill the wheelbarrow up with coals, and then you bring the wheelbarrow back in between two fire lanes. A fire lane is about, it's sod, it's grass, and it's three feet wide, 18 feet long. There's one there. Put the wheelbarrow between. Put another one on the other side of it. And then just take a flathead shovel, shovel into that wheelbarrow, and sprinkle those babies on top of that grass. And that's what you fire walk on. Right? Well, I'm having none of that. I'm in the back. I'm hiding behind 3,500 people, chanting, drums are going on, 
People are starting to firewalk. They're screaming. They're yelling. They're celebrating. It's a dog and pony show. <laughs> like anything. It's so hard to describe. There's nothing like it on earth. Unless, of course, you go to a Tony Robbins seminar. It's just an unbelievable experience, right? Well, I'm hiding in the back, obviously. So I'm not going to do this firewalk. Well, Tony Robbins knows that this is literally one of the most life-changing experiences any human can go through. He knows that. Fire walking has been around for a thousand years. It's been used by cultures everywhere for a whole host of reasons. Everything from graduations to marriages to birth to, you know, it's, it's the rite of passage. It's, it's unbelievable. It's been around for a long, long time. And so Tony knows how powerful it is. Well, he doesn't want anybody to miss out. So what's he do? Well, he knows there's people like me. He knows we're going to come hide the back. So what's he do? Smart ass trains people to come find you. So literally, you've got people going to the back looking for people like me. And it worked. Because I'm back there hiding out. And all of a sudden, here comes this guy. Comes out of nowhere. All of a sudden, he makes eye contact with me. And now he won't take his eyes off me, right? Staring at me. He probably gets, I don't know, 20 feet from me, maybe. And he said, he said, hey, man, are, are, are you okay? And I'm like, when we're not okay, what do we do? We lie immediately, right? I'm we go, fine. oh, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm fine. Nothing to see here, pal. Move along. He says, well, hey, man, you gonna, you gonna fire walk tonight? And I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> like, no. You know, I said it with that tonality, right? And he goes, hey, man, that's cool. He goes, that's not a problem. We don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. And I'm like, okay, I like this guy. He's going to get me out of here. Well, then here's where it gets pretty interesting in my life. One stranger, Nikki, I don't know who this guy is to this day. I have no idea. But look what he did. He asked me one question that changed my life forever. One stranger, one question. So don't think it can't happen. It can. It did. It does. It did. Um, he said, wouldn't you at least like to watch? And I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Sure. Let's watch these people burn their feet off. This should be fun. <laughs> he said, well, hey, man, you can't see anything from way back here. Can't see anything. Well, he's telling the truth. I'm 100 yards away from the fire walking. I got 3,500 people in front of me. I can't see anything. I can hear them. They're jumping up and down and cheering and celebrating and they're clapping and the drums are going, oh yeah, that's all going on, but I can't see them physically. And he said, well, just get in line and eventually you'll get up there. You'll be able to see it. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> I took the bait, but in his defense, he's telling the truth because you know what, Nikki, without him, I'm not on the who the fuck podcast. I, I don't, go to work for Tony Robbins. I don't go to Google, NASA, you know, my whole life. None of that happens unless that guy says one thing to me that gets me in that line. Because when I'm in that line, I'm kind of walking along, you know, and again, just kind of being part of the, the, the movement and the shovel of the energy of all that. And this guy comes up to me and he whispers in my ear and he says, he knows when you're ready. When he says, go, you go. And pew, he just disappeared into the night. And I'm like, what the hell was that? What? Who was that? What What did they do that for? Where's that coming from? Well, so, so I'm kind of trudging along, walking along. All of a sudden, I get to a point I still can't see in front of me, but I can see at an angle. I can see through the crowd. And they're doing it. They're fire walking. I'm watching them. They're making this strong move, and they're throwing their hands in the air, and then they're walking. Every race, every creed, every color, every age, they're walking. And so now I'm mesmerized. I'm just watching it, right? It's like, you know, we're told don't don't look at a car wreck, right? When you when you drive by, right? Yeah, well, we do it anyway, right? So I'm asphyxiated on it. I can't take my eyes off it. And I'm watching it, I'm watching, I'm watching, all of a sudden, boom. Guess where I am? I'm at the front of the line. And I'm looking down and I'm looking at that fire lane, right? It's about three feet wide, 18 feet long. And they sprinkled the coals on top of it. And they're glowing bright red. The wheelbarrow's right there next to it. You can feel the heat coming off. And I'm losing my shit. I am staring into the abyss. I'm scared to death. My heart, I feel like it's going to jump out of my chest any minute. And all, there's a trainer standing there. And all of a sudden, the trainer goes, eyes up. Oh, shit. Oh, that's right. Okay, so now my eyes are up. All right. Uh, keep them up. Yeah. 
Well, I'm in a room for Tony Robbins for 10 hours. Guess what he teaches you to do? Keep your eyes up. Don't stare at what you fear. I want you to look to the end at the celebration where you're going to celebrate this experience. And so now my eyes are up and all of a sudden the trainer goes, he goes, uh, squeeze your fist and say yes. And I went, yes. And he went stronger. And I went, yes. <laughs> well, he could tell. He knew. He's doing this every day. I don't know how long, every day, how many thousands of people he walked. He could knew I wasn't in a peak state. He knew I wasn't there yet. So what did he do? He screams at me, stronger. So I fight or flight, right? I threw my hands in the air and I screamed at the top of my lungs. And he goes, go, go, go. I took off. Well, here's the first thing I learned about firewalking, the beauty of it. When you take the first step, oh, you'll take the second, third, fourth. And fourth. <laughs> I absolutely promise you. It's insane, right? Well, he stages two people at the end. They, they, they lock arms, right? And they catch you. Because hell, I'd have walked all the way to Albuquerque at that point. And they catch you. And they're like, stop, wipe your feet and celebrate. And so I'm wiping my feet and I'm celebrating. And all of a sudden, I'm real. And I look back and all of a sudden, I realize I burnt myself really bad. Really, really bad, right? And so now I'm looking at my foot and I look at it. It's dirty, but there's no burns. It just feels like they're burnt. Oh, it's my other foot. Look at it. No, no, same thing. It's dirty, but there are no burns. And so now I'm in the celebration end with thousands of other people who are celebrating at a level like you've never seen or witnessed before. It's like a soccer mom and her, you know, her daughter kicked the winning soccer that won the championship and she's out there celebrating, right? Yeah. That's what it's like. And yet you've got thousands of people celebrating at that level and feeling that kind of intensity. We just walked on coals over a thousand degrees. And we didn't burn ourselves. Okay. That can be pretty eye opening because if I can do that, what else can I do? Yeah. But you know, what's really cool, Nikki, and what's really interesting about this was the next day. Here's the next, that, by the way, this is a four day event, right? Okay. The firewalk, uh, UPW, unleash the power within the firewalk experience. That's day one, the night up. Now we're on day two, the next morning. We're standing in the foyer getting ready to go into the venue. I've never, I've never witnessed anything like it in my life. I've never seen strangers get along like that ever. Just an ever. incredibly bonding experience. Yeah, it's bonding, right? Because look what we did last night. Near-death experience, kind of, because I'm watching them. They're they're laughing and they're crying and they're hugging and they're connecting humanistically and you know, it was so beautiful. It was so gorgeous. And yet we don't know any each other. We didn't know shit about any of us until, you know, the night before. And we still don't know that much other than look what we did last night together collectively. And it's so shared humanity. Means, it's shared it is, humanity. Right? It's self-worth. It's self-confidence. It's self-belief. Boom. Together we moved, right? It's like, where's Everest? <laughs> okay, let's go, people. The bus is coming. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, so like the next day, I believe it was, I met one of Tony's trainers, Ted Macy, such a sweet man. I love this man and his lovely wife. Uh, they're Mary Macy, amazing people. And so I'm talking to Ted and we're just chatting and it's a really cool dude. And I'm a little older than him, but pretty close. And he's got this big handlebar mustache and he's really a cool dude, man. He's a really beautiful, beautiful human. And so we're talking about this and I made some comment like, hey, man, it must be really cool to be in this environment on a regular basis to feed off this. He goes, oh, yeah, every, you know, I'm, I'm here, you know, sometimes eight, 10 times a year and I get to feed off of this. And I said, oh, man, that's wow. beautiful. And he says, by the way, you see all those people over there standing with the black with the black shirts and they got the pink writing on them? Yeah. He goes, they're volunteers, dude. They're people just like you that were probably here at the last event and, and, have, and have become volunteer crew members. And, he, and I go, so how, what do you do there? He goes, what do you get home? Call Robin's Research. Call, ask him to send you a volunteer crew application. They'll send it to you. Fill it out. Keep your fingers crossed, man. And I did. And I think it was probably seven, eight weeks after I filled out that application, I got a letter in the mail. I'll never forget it. It said, Dave Alvin, congratulations. You've been selected to crew with the Anthony Robbins companies in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holy shit. I thought I'd hit the lottery. Man. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, my gosh. I get to go hang out and help and be part of it? 
So it was really an exhilarating moment for me. So once I got there and, you know, when you fill it out, you fill out what you're good at, right? Like I, you know, I, I, I was on a, I lived on a farm. I knew how to use equipment. I knew how to use tools. I knew how to use a log splitter. Um, I had a military background. I had a security background. So I fit the mold to be not only on the fire team, but to be part of the security detail to help take care of Tony's celebrities. Well, wasn't that fun? <laughs> I mean, I had a ball and I was really one of the only guys on the team at the time that had military background. So I fit right in. And then I, you know, I was outside with the fire team and I started learning the logistics and all the stuff behind the scenes, uh, what kind of wood to use, how long to let it burn, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, shortly after I got on that team, I think I crewed five or six times and they offered me a, a crew position as a, as a, uh, independent contractor. So as a volunteer, you had to pay your way, right? Cost you a couple mm -hmm. of grand every time you wanted to go to a Tony Robbins seminar and volunteer. You got to pay your airfare, got to pay yeah. your hotel, got to pay your food, got to pay your transportation. So you could easily spend 1500 to two grand. Well, when they offered me the subcontractor position, they paid for all that. So I went from my wife going, I'm kind of tired of paying two grand every time you want to go play with Tony Robbins. <laughs> uh, and so that just turned into, oh, they're going to pay you now? Okay, I'm okay with that. Yeah, right. And then, and then once I took her to an event, she knew, oh, she goes, okay, I get it. I drank the Kool-Aid. Okay, I see why you're here. It's all good. Go do it. She literally looked at me at the eye one day. And she said, you go as far with this guy as you want to go. And so she opened the door and, and it was a beautiful thing. It was such a great gift that Stacia gave me for that. And I did. And I maxed out. Uh, in 2000, and this is all happening, you know, what, 95, 96, 97, 98. 2000 in 2003 tony offered me the captain's position what that meant was i would be in charge of all of his firewalks globally and and and, and originally i said i can't do it well why can't you do it well because i homeschool oh okay yeah all right i see that well okay what if we paid to have your kids travel on the road with us would that make a difference <laughs> you think yeah. yeah just my just ask my kids <laughs> yeah right they got to go on the road with Tony Robbins and her mom and dad homeschooled. I mean, what a beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous thing to have happen to them. Uh, Tony and I and the rest of the team went to uh, London in 2005. That's where we set the world record. Uh, we firewalked more people than it's ever been walked on the planet, to my knowledge, 12,300 people. Wow. I'm 99.99% sure that's a world record. The only thing that comes close to it is another Tony Robbins seminar. Now, I, 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 you know, full disclosure, Guinness Book was not there, but we don't care. <laughs> hey. Again, I don't think one's ever come anywhere close to that. And so that was a beautiful moment. Had the family with me there. Um, and then 2014, my life took another churn. And that's when Google called me. Wanted to know, are you the Dave Alvin that does the firewalks for Tony Robbins? Yeah, what can I do for you? Well, if you're not under any contractual obligation or non-complete, we'd like to talk to you about hiring. Okay, what you got going on, guys? <laughs> well, we have an event coming up. Da, da, da. We'd like to have 148 executives. We want to put you in there. We want to create a really powerful experience around that. Listen to that, Mr. and Mrs. Entrepreneurs out there and business owners. Google <laughs> said they wanted to take 148 executives and create a really powerful experience around the graduation. Imagine that. Think they did their research? Think they know something you don't know? Bottom line is, yeah, of course they did. In fact, when they first started talking firewalk, I'm like, guys, I can't do this during the day. I have to be able to see the coals. We can't do it. So now I'll tell you what I could do. If you want to do something in the middle of the day, I can do the glass walk experience. They're like the glass walk experience. What's that? That's where I teach them how to walk on broken glass. And they're like, ooh, that's scary. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, that could create the same experience, couldn't it? Pretty close. It'll scare the hell out of you. I can guarantee you that. I promise you that part. Back when they booked me and all that, we're out there the night before the event. And they're like, uh, Dave, listen, um, could we ask you a question? We're kind of hoping you'd be okay with something. Okay, well, what do you want to do? They said, well, before we bring you on stage, there's a scene with, with uh, Bruce Willis in Die Hard where he's got to run across the glass, right? And his feet are all bloody. And I go, do you actually want to show that? They go, yeah, would you be okay? I'm like, oh, hell yes. You're my kind of people. Damn right, show it. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Put that Let's, in their heads before they have to go do it. <laughs> absolutely. Give them to me. Can you imagine about a bunch of intellectual freaking Google types? Oh, yeah. From the Valley. Oh, how fun that, that's going to be. But it got better because they came back and they said, and there's a song we'd like to play to bring it when you bring me out on stage from the green room. OK, what's that? Uh, there's a song by Annie Lennox. Walking and I went, broken glass. Walking on broken <laughs> glass, baby. All right. Let's. Yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of literally the key. That's where my that's where my my career came to. The I said, okay, if the, one of the biggest companies in the world wants an incredible corporate team building experience that's going to cause incredible change in people, I'm their boy. Because they're not going to hire Tony Robbins. I can tell you that. I think he's three million dollars now for a, for a day appearance. <laughs> that doesn't count the firewall. So. Um, I just happen to be at the right place at the right time with the right experience yeah. because it's such a powerful experience. It changes people's lives, period. Well, I don't care what they say. I've seen hundreds and thousands of people. Well, something um, that you said that I think is really, I wanted to come back to too, is just the way that your overall life experience is sort of the intersection of everything, your military background, your logging background, all these other things that you've done, your entrepreneurial spirit those combined to create the right circumstances for you too. And I feel like that's one of the things where, you know, I look back at my life and I think about how I've gotten to where I am today. And when you're in it, you're just sort of like, okay, I don't really understand this feels maybe pointless or random in my yeah. life. And then all of a sudden you sort of look back and you're like, well, this makes total sense because I wouldn't be able to have gotten here if I didn't have this precise combination of experiences that make me qualified or Absolutely. to your point, intriguing to a business like Google to say, hey, we recognize that you have this very unique skill set and and are capable in these ways that I'm sure if you asked yourself 20 years prior, you probably would have been like, that would, why would that ever happen? Right. Like in what scenario right. are you exactly. fathoming that that's actually like where you end up? And I think it's magical for us as human beings to really acknowledge how, you know, we, we sit here and we try to plan and we want to believe that we know what's going to happen at the end of the day, there is so little that we can control. But I think that when we actually allow ourselves the space to just flow with it and take Take that on and be, you know, present in those elements of who we are and what we're doing. It really does come to fruition in a way that tends to often surprise us, but also, you know, through looking in retrospect, you're sort of like, yeah, I guess it really does all make sense how that happened, right? And I, I feel like your story is just such a testament to that. Normally in life, can you see that? Yes. Right. Yes. That's normally how we try to do things in life. Yes. So we do. Says, yeah, go ahead. We have, we be. Because that's what society teaches us. <laughs> it's wrong. It's the correct way to do it. You be, you do, you have. Yes, 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 yes. So much. Ponder that for a few minutes. Uh, Why wait? What are you waiting for? Why not feel amazing now? And I'll, I'll tell you where this really helped me. When I was flying out to Google, right? I'm in the plane, going out there, going out to Google, going to be on stage. Pretty pretty big moment, right? And all of a sudden, my little, my little not-so-good friend jumped up on my shoulder and said, what makes you think you're good enough to do Google? You're going to screw this up. You suck. You drug out a piece of shit. You alcoholic. You, what? Oh, you're going to lose. You're going to be an embarrassment. I mean, sh shut the fuck up. He was just ranting, that voice in my head that tells us all this bullshit, right? Because life is really comes down to one thing, state management. And my, my moment right there, my state management wasn't being managed very well because I was listening to this bullshit, right? And so all of a sudden, the other little guy on my other shoulder stood up. And he said, uh, uh, Dave, I'd like to remind you of something. Uh, back in 2003, you and Tony Robbins went to London and you firewalked 12,300 people. You're one of the best in the world at this. Tell that dude to shut the fuck up. Right? So if you're going to have an inner dialogue with yourself, which we all do, maybe it might be a, a good idea to make sure that you're the voice. Now I'm the voice. Not some bullshit from my past that's trying to take me down a road that I'm not who I am. 
or that's trying to convince me that I'm not the chances of being born one in 400 trillion. That's the number. Only two people on the planet that can create us anyway. There's only one mom. She's got one egg out of many. Dad helped. Okay. He contributed a group of swimmers. Well, how many swimmers were in there, dad? Eh, somewhere between 50 to 100 million. Oh, shit. So there was some competition, you think? Yeah, well, that was you. So you swam fast. You broke through and you got there. That's what happened. So call it what you want. I, I believe it's just moments like this, or somebody's listening to your podcast, it's, it's time for them to rise up and realize that they're the one in that incest, incest, ancestral train that's going to rise up, right? Because if we go back, to, let's say we go back 12 generations, and we look at all the people that it took for you to be here right now with me, you and I, Nikki, all your listeners, everything right now in this moment, what had to happen in every single person's life? Well, if we go back 12 generations, that's 400 years. How many people were involved? Because without every one of them, you're not here. Your happy ass is not here. Yeah. 12 generations. Hmm. 400 years. Guess what? 4,094 people. Think any of those people went through some struggles a couple hundred years ago? You know, they didn't drive to McDonald's. Right. They went out and killed their food. They stitched their clothes. They, they, they plowed the fields. They learned how to skin a deer and a, and a, and a buffalo and everything else yeah. because it was survival. And if you don't do it, you're going to die, period. There's no, oh, well, I have option three, four, and five. No, you don't. So 4,094 people paid a hell of a price for Dave Albin to be on Nikki's podcast today. And so guess what? I'm going to rise up. I, I made a decision 35 years ago, right? That took my ancestry, my train in a completely different direction because I chose to say, nope, I'm not going to drink any more alcohol. I'm not going to do any more drugs one day at a time. And that's allowed me to influence hundreds of thousands of people with the Firewalk experience who turned around and influenced thousands of other people because they were influenced by the Firewalk experience. It's incredible. I love the way that you framed that too, Dave, and, and generationally going back and looking at that because, you know, you said somebody listening to your podcast needs to hear this. I, somebody hosting this podcast needs to hear that because I I see it in myself too. I, I know that this is my purpose. I feel so called yeah. to it. I'm continuously reminded of that by just people who are kind and gracious with their words. And at the same time, there is, like you said, there's that little voice going, yeah, but why does anybody care what you have to say? Or who's like, what makes you different? What is it? And we sit there and we justify why we won't allow ourselves to reach our own potential instead of justifying to ourselves that that is like our, that is our purpose. That is our our lifeblood. That is why we are here. Playing small doesn't serve anything or anybody. Stepping into your genius, it's not easy. And that's what you're doing. You've got a beautiful podcast. Thank you very much. It's gorgeous. I mean, everything about it, the way you've articulated it, the way you've set it up, the you know, the pre-call. A lot of your listeners probably don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, where Nikki and I got to meet each other. We talked, we worked out all kinds of things. And, you know, she wants to deliver at a high level. Let me tell you what she's doing here. She's all in. And if you can't see that, then you don't understand the concept of all in. It's like anything else we do. When's the last time you did something and you were all in? This is, That's and it, I love that yeah. you said that too, because this is the thing that made me feel like I needed to be all in. And so many things that I've done in my life before were not that. It was like, I, I said frequently in my tech career, I was like, I'm, I feel lucky that I've gotten as far as I had, but it was like, I was always giving 70 when somebody else was giving 100 because I didn't feel like I needed to, because I didn't want to. I was doing enough to still be successful yeah. and still take pride in my work because I wouldn't just like hack it and not care. But I also knew that the fulfillment that I need to get from something is the driver behind me going all in. That's the key. That's the right? absolute key to life. You just heard it right there from you. Here's what people confused easily they achieve at a high level 
Look at me. I made a lot of money. Look at me. I've got a beautiful family. Look at me. I've got this. I've got that. I achieved this. I achieved that. Okay. I got a question for you. How fulfilled do you feel? Oh, oh, well, not that fulfilled. Well, then you fail because success of that level or achievement at that level that's not balanced with fulfillment is failure. You better get that shit figured out. And there's a way to do it. I made a choice. Tony Robbins, oh my God, go on the road with him. Oh my God, could you imagine? Oh, I can't. Why? Well, because you homeschool. Oh, well, what if we paid to have him go have the kids come with us? My daughter was six years old the first time she firewalked. My son was nine. We firewalked in New York at a Tony Robbins seminar. So you know what I mean? So it's the decisions that we make. And it's the moments of the that we're in with the moments, the decisions we make. Because it's in our moments of decision when our destinies are shaped. And if you make a decision out of fear, you're fucked. Because fear's not done with you. It'll continue to lie to you, cheat you, misrepresent, and take you down the wrong road. Nope. Because the fears you don't overcome become your limits. And, oh. and we all know this. What doesn't challenge you doesn't change you. It's not going to happen. Navy oh SEALs God. don't. Navy SEALs don't become Navy SEALs by sitting in a classroom. No. They do things like the night swim off the coast of San Onofre, where there's 16 different species of sharks in the water, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and they throw your happy ass overboard. Is this something you've done? No, but I know. I was like, you said you were in have. the military. I was like, did this well, I'm in the military, so I understand that part, if you will, that component. Yeah. But I, I've got some really good friends that are Navy SEALs. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine. And this is the thing, right, is what you speak to also, Dave, is listening to what you feel called to. Because making those decisions is, in my experience, rooted in trusting yourself. And it's so hard for us. We listen to those younger parts of ourselves that tell us that we're not good, we're not worthy, we can't do it. We, Why would anybody listen to me, want me to do this, whatever. It manifests in our personal and professional lives. And I said this the other day to my wife, I was like, isn't it fascinating to just think about how as human beings, we as individuals are our most like limiting factor. If we could get out of our own heads enough, we would be able to recognize our potential more. And instead, we just live in this state of, well, what if, or I don't believe this about myself, so how can I succeed? And it's like, put that shit aside and figure out what it is that's going to, like we said, bring you fulfillment, but also bring you joy, give you a sense of purpose, give you a sense of gratitude. Like the thing that you and I, I think, really share among, I'm certain, certain other philosophies because of our conversations, but it's like that sense of gratitude for the experiences mm. that have led us to where we are and the people who have helped us get here. Because you said, I don't even know that guy's name, but he changed the entire trajectory of your life. And it's, it's magical like as human beings that we can have an influence like that. Because like you said from the beginning, if you can just impact one person and that helps them, that's to me so worth it. But when you can sit there and say, I've done this for hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And then that proliferates because it's not just the impact you have on them. It's the impact that they then have on other people and their own lives. And it's like, this is the true beauty of humanity and community and what happens when you are doing, when you are living your purpose and actually in a place of belief that there is more than what we've just allowed ourselves to be constrained to. And I feel like you're just, you exemplify that, Dave, and it's just truly amazing to oh. hear your story and share the mic with you. Well, thank you. And, you know, one movie I watch every single year, I get asked all the way, hey, Dave, what's your favorite? It's a Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart. Because <laughs> it, it it's it's all written in there. Yeah, it's a wonderful life, Jimmy Stewart. You want to jump over the edge, man, right? Because here's what we know: life's never as bad as it seems. Life's never as good as it seems. Reality's somewhere in the middle. Go find and operate from a place of understanding how patterns work and state management. Because at the end of the day, that's that's what we got. When you speak um, about state management, can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that a little bit? Do you see it as mental, emotional state? And or how do you constitute that? Yeah, um, I think one of the strongest lessons you want to go real deep there, go read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Oh, I oh, I've I've listened to the audiobook. Um 
in bits and pieces. So yeah, a, a bits and pieces, story. right? Well, yeah, I, it's so, ugly. I, I, so there I, it is, right? How did he do that? How did he get out of Auschwitz? They killed his family right in front of him, and he had to figure out a way to get out of Auschwitz. So what did he do? Two things. One, he said, even though I'm standing naked in a yard, I'm freezing to death. They've killed my family. I'm probably going to die in that oven. Um, but you know what? Someone fucking needs to tell this story. Hmm. Okay. There's purpose. Note, make note to self. Purpose helps. Purpose drives. Purpose creates. And so he realized that they could take everything. Except one thing, you can't take my attitude. I have to give that away. Hmm, something to think about. That's a choice. I don't care what you do in life. I don't care how many good things happen to you, how many bad things happen to you. You've created a story about that. Victor Frankl created a story. And he created one that got him out of Auschwitz to tell the story. Same thing in your life. It's no different. You want to change your life? Literally? Change your story. That you have actually, control. That book, I know it sounds simple, right? Yeah, that book helped me at a very pivotal time in my life. I was listening to it around the time that I was leaving the abusive relationship that I was in. And I had just lost my mom. And I was grappling a lot with <laughs> life, a sense of self. <laughs> like, Good, under- you're supposed to. Right. And it's like it just it it empowered me so much to hear that story, to hear other stories. Somebody that I love listening to their lectures is Alan Watts and like his oh. philosophy on just <laughs> humanity and spirituality. Oh, yeah. And it brings you back to the center of it's not about these material things. It's not about the day to day stuff that we feel like we have to get done. It is really it draws you back to who you are. And like you said, with Viktor Frankl. You can take everything from me, but I still am who I am. And to be able to own that and have that is just, that's the gift that we can give ourselves. And it's hard because a lot of people, it took me a long time, Dave, to recognize that I didn't like myself and I didn't love myself. And it wasn't this overt thing. It wasn't this like, I hate myself. I'm a terrible person, right? But I was in therapy and I remember just recognizing how uncomfortable it made me to say that I liked myself, let alone loved myself. It felt weird. And it was because I was so afraid of what everybody else thought of me and how I appeared to them that I would shrink myself down lose sight of that part of me that I can control, that I can hold on to, that visceral knowing of who you are. And once I sort of shed that expectation, everybody else's validation that I needed, I was like, no, I, I'm i a good person. I like who I am. I love who I am. I do things with good intentions. I mean, I'm a human. We all make mistakes. I have historically had a very short fuse. I'm not always the best at dealing with frustration, but you know, the big part of it, and I think you and I both speak to this quite a bit, is the self-awareness is the step to getting to the growth. Because if yeah. you ignore it and you don't acknowledge it, then you're never going to see the growth that you want to see because you're going to keep hiding from it. And it's like you confronted your biggest demons head on and were like, no fucking more. I'm just not doing this this way anymore. And I just applaud your strength and your resilience and your your effort to go into your life and say, I own my life and I own my decisions because a lot of people don't do that. No, I get that. Yeah, you're right. And it's sad. And because there's such a life on the other side, um, you know, we know that everything we probably ever ever wanted is right over there on the other side of fear. Uh, It's right over there, not too far away. And, you know, again, it comes back to um, how, how we deal with it and what, what we tell ourselves, you know, it's funny at our seminars, I'm, I'm such a horrible person. I do a terrible thing to my, to my audience. So I put a picture, uh, on the screen behind me and I just leave it up there. And it's a buddy, it's a guy by the name of Eric Weyenmeyer and people have no idea who Eric is, right? You know, he climbed Mount Everest. Okay. So there's a picture of him there and he's up on this, he's at the summit, right? And so I'll talk for a while and I'll talk for a while and I'll say, so who here, who here can tell me where Eric's standing? Behind me. And somebody will go, Mount Everest. That's correct, sir. You're absolutely correct. And you know what? I want you to know something about Eric. He's climbed the seven highest mountains on seven continents to the summit. That just happens to be one of them, right? Then I'll go on and say, and by the way, 
Put him on a mountain bike, he can tear it up bad. Uh, put him in a kayak, he can probably navigate, um, you know, any any river in the world. In fact, he had just finished doing the um, uh, the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. So, yeah, there's a picture of him on Evans. But here's here's what I want you to know about Eric. There's something I think you'll like when you when you learn this, and that is he's blind. So I don't know what bullshit you're telling yourself every day when you get out of bed. But let me tell you something. That man right there just climbed the seven highest mountains on this planet. He mountain bikes and he kayaks and he's doing it a blind. Sometimes people go, well, is he 100% blind? No, you are. <laughs> For asking the question. Wake up. I'm trying to tell you something. If A, a blind man, 100%. By the way, he lost his sight when I think he was seven. If he can climb the seven highest mountains on seven continents, what do you think you might be able to do? If you can firewalk, what else could you do? Could you start that job? Could you start that podcast? Could you get into that relationship? Could you have a family? Could you go ahead and start that business? You know, what else can you do? And that's really what happens. That's what happened to me. Because once I got to that one point, I had faced my fear and I beat it. And once I learned how to do that, I knew I could do it again. And I also realized how powerful fear, the role that it was playing in my life. Yeah. And once, and then once I kind of broke through that, you know, my life was like, oh, okay. It can be pretty spectacular. It, yep. it is spectacular. <laughs> it, it is spectacular. You have such a story, Dave. And thank you so much for spending this extra time with me. Oh my gosh. My you're pleasure. just such a gem of a human. I uh -huh. feel like you're, you're such a great combination of like, you've got the energy where you're kind of stern and intense, but there's this gentleness to the way mm. that you share your story and kindness for people who are going through these struggles. And I yeah. feel so connected to your story and your passion is just, it just resonates. And I'm so grateful for your time that we were able to share the mic and hang out for yeah. longer. Thank you so much for the extra yeah. time. Sincerely. Cool. I love it. It was awesome. I you, would love you did this. You brought this out. So be clear about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. I am also learning how to take compliments better. <laughs> That's a part of my journey. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. So I would love it. Um, obviously, if you can tell people where they can find you, I know firewalkadventures.com is where they can look more into what you're doing yeah, with your business. Yeah. Um, but is there anywhere else you want them to follow you or check you out? Uh, I mean, they're welcome to do whatever they want. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> here. To, you know, if you want to go to my website, it's all there. Uh, my academy's coming up. I do the Dave Alvin Firewalk Academy. So typically, you know, when people come to us, they either come to me and hire me and they, you know, I, we go in and create the firewalk experience and the board break experience uh, or the glass walk and the arrow break experience. And we design it all. And the client tells me what's going on. But last year I offered, if it was any of my clients or anybody out there that want, would want to come to the academy. So I'll teach you everything that I do and how I do it. And then you can go back in your respective companies or in your H&R department or, you know, you're a trainer or a coach or whatever. And then you can come to the academy and we show you all this stuff, which is really cool. Awesome. Um, I do it once a year. I bring in nine people at a time. That's very specific. I do. I do the number nine for a reason, which I teach you about in the academy. Okay. So that's, a, that's all on my website as well. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. You sharing your story and opening up the way that you have. These are the conversations that I thrive on, that I live for, and that I really value for listeners because it is not just let me talk about, you know, bits and pieces of my life and this is the trajectory, et cetera. But like you really went that level deeper and said, these are the parts of me that I've worked on, that I'm still navigating, that I that I'm sharing with all of you. And I feel like that gives people an opportunity to do that within themselves. And that is something that more than anything, I hope people get from this show. And in particular, I'm certain they'll get it from this episode because of how you've shown up. And I just, I appreciate that more than you can possibly understand. It's, you know, many are called, few are chosen. You know, when I retired from Tony Robbins, one of the last things he said to me, he goes, Albie, he goes, look, with great wisdom comes great responsibility. Make us proud. So that's that's what we're here to do.
You absolutely have. Well, thank you so much, gang. That's all for this episode of Who the Fuck. We'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks for listening to Who the Fuck. And if you like what you hear, share the show with your friends, family, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs a healthy dose of introspection and raw authenticity. Feel free to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. It's always appreciated. And you can also visit whothefck.com to check out more content. Plus, you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at who the fck underscore pod to keep up to date with what's new in my world and for exclusive bonus content catch you on the flip side